Sorry, Doc. Had to be Morden. Someone else might have gotten it wrong. The Mass Effect trilogy is known for its phenomenal characters. When most players think of these games, they're probably contemplating squad mates and crew like Garrus, Tally, Liara, Joker, etc. But there are a lot of great NPCs in this franchise that don't get quite as much love or recognition. In this video, we're going to explore the 12 most underrated characters in Mass Effect. Number 1. Kirihi our Solarian comrade in arms is mainly remembered for his hold the line speech on Vermeer in Mass Effect 1. But there's a lot more going on with our second favorite STG contact, particularly in Mass Effect 3. If we manage to save Kirihi on Vermeer, he'll appear during Priority Sirkesh, where we learn he's been promoted to Major. What I like about Kirihi is he's got Shepard's back no matter what. Regardless of the Salarian politician's stance on the war, he pledges to help Shepard retake Earth. He also gives Shepard the Scorpion handgun, which is one of the most fun sidearms to use in Mass Effect 3. How do I not have one of those? Finally, if Thane is not around in Mass Effect 3, Kirihi will sacrifice himself to save the Salarian counselor from Kai Lang during Priority the Citadel 2. His willingness to sacrifice himself for the greater causes is shown time and again in these games, on Vermeer, on Sir Kesh, on the Citadel, and on Earth. Kirihi's a truly noble character, and I really wish he would have been a squad mate in one of these games. He could have made a great addition to the roster in Mass Effect 3. Number 2. Emily Wong This is the only reporter in the trilogy that Shepard doesn't want to punch and it's because she's actually a legit investigative journalist trying to expose corruption instead of pushing a political agenda like Kalisa or Diana. She first asked Shepard for help to expose organized crime on the Citadel by investigating Fist. Then she's doing a story about overworked siege sec traffic control agents to promote improved safety standards. It's unfortunate the route that Bioware took with this character. During the marketing campaign for Mass Effect 3, the studio set up a Twitter account called Alliance News Network, which featured a series of in-universe tweets reporting on the outbreak of the Reaper invasion. Many of the tweets were from Emily Wong, who detailed the Reaper attacks happening in Los Angeles. During the coverage, she is mortally wounded in a firefight before doing a kamikaze run by crashing her sky car into a Reaper. Damn, Bioware really did her dirty killing off the character on Twitter before the game even came out. I think Emily Wong would have made a much better on-ship reporter in Mass Effect 3, but instead, all we got was Diana Aller's battle tits. Number 3. Nihilus There are a lot of unique things about Nihilus. He's the first Turian we ever meet in Mass Effect. He's the first alien we ever meet in Mass Effect, period. And he's the first Spectre we come across. And while he doesn't get much screen time in the series because, you know, he's still a great character. What I like about Nihilus is that he steps up to the plate to vouch for Shepard and the commander's nomination as the first human Spectre. In Mass Effect 1, humanity is still relatively new to the intergalactic political scene, having made first contact with the Council races only three decades prior. There is still a lot of organizational inertia and resistance to give humanity a seat at the table. There are no human specters, no humans on the council, and there is still some prejudice amongst the Turians who still remember fighting against humanity in the first contact war. So it was a big deal for Nihilus to stick his neck out for Shepard. He was a real one. Rip Nihilus. Number 4. Televasir. So this is our first villain character on the list. Another Spectre. Most players will likely hate Vasir because she tries to kill our favorite blue waifu, Liara. But if you can put this injustice aside for a moment, it's interesting to consider Vasir's motives. She's a Spectre, an organization of special agents who are allowed to use any means necessary to advance the interests of the Council, which is typically some form of enforced galactic peace. It's flawed for sure, kind of like the UN in real life. Part of being a good Spectre involves obtaining and acting on good intel, a service provided by the Shadow Broker. Vasir has a good relationship with the existing Shadow Broker, so she goes to bat for him in Mass Effect 2's DLC. She doesn't know Liara from Adam, so she has no problem executing a hit if it means she can maintain that steady intel source. Intel which perhaps can help her save lives in the future. That being said, I still think Vasir is wrong. 
She has no qualms killing innocent civilians to achieve her goals. Is it truly worth going that far to help protect the Shadow Broker? Nonetheless, it is interesting to try and view things from her perspective. This is something that Bioware has typically done really well with their villain characters. Number 5. James Vega Lots of players dog on my homeboy, Party Vega, but he's a much better character than most people give him credit for. It's incredibly difficult to introduce new characters at the end of a trilogy and have them stack up against already beloved squad mates from previous games. James can't compare to our faves like Garrus and Tally, but if you take the time to get to know James, you'll learn there's much more to his character than just being a beefed out military bro. James previously led an Alliance unit on Fell Prime, a human colony that was attacked by the Collectors. During the attack, James had to make a tough decision recover important intel about the Collectors, or abandon this information and attempt to save the colonists. He decided to go for the intel in hopes that the Alliance could prevent further attacks in the future. The entire colony was wiped out along with everyone in his unit. James feels incredible guilt over his decision on Fell Prime, and doesn't feel like he deserves any promotions or praise, even though he was recommended for the N7 program as a result of his outstanding service record. Shepard can either encourage Vega to join the N7 program explicitly, or give him the space to make the decision on his own. James also has a lot of great moments in the Citadel DLC, commenting on Shepard's romantic partners, making fun of Liara's biotics, challenging the commander to break his pull-up record, and of course, bringing the party vibes. Number 6. Paddock Wicks Our second favorite Solarian scientist makes an appearance in Mass Effect 3. We first meet him during the Sir Kesh mission, but he will play a much bigger role in the story if Morden died in Mass Effect 2. There are a bunch of different characters who replace deceased squadmates in Mass Effect 3. Check out my video on the topic if you want to meet them all. But out of all the replacement characters, Paddock is the most fleshed out one. In Morden's absence, Wix will step up to help cure the Genophage and join us on the Normandy briefly. We can ask Wix about his bar fight with Morden and his strange research interests. Hoping it will inspire a resurgence in Krogan sex. I've always wondered how they made it. Not what I meant. But at the end of the day, can we really trust Paddock Wicks with the Genophage cure? Sorry, Doc. Had to be Morden. Someone else might have gotten it wrong. <laughs> Number 7. Ken Donnelly Ken is kinda like the groundskeeper Willy of Mass Effect. And yeah, I'm basically just saying that because he's Scottish. Ken's interactions with Gabby in Mass Effect 3 are hilarious. He's just so thirsty the whole time while being totally oblivious to Gabby's interest in him. I also love how offended Ken gets when he learns the elusive man drinks bourbon. So I hear the elusive man drinks bourbon. <laughs> yes. That makes sense now. What do you mean? You love whiskey. A hey, scotch, my dear Ken. Hey, scotch. Bat drinks American bourbon. Completely different. He's a psychotic megalomaniac and you've got problems with his choice of liquor. You've obviously never experienced the peat aroma of a fine Ely Scourge. Number 8. Tarquin Victus This is one of the most badass characters in Mass Effect 3 with a great redemption arc. Victus is a Turian military leader who received his post through good old-fashioned nepotism. He was tasked with conducting Black Ops on Tachanka to disable an ancient Turian bomb that had fallen into the hands of Cerberus but he royally screwed up the mission and got most of his unit killed in the process. His soldiers resent him and don't respect him either, but despite his unearned position, he owns his mistakes and steps up to motivate his men to help him make things right. With a little help from Commander Shepard, Victus leads his unit to complete their mission. In the end, he sacrifices his own life to make sure the mission is a success, saving millions of lives in the process, and ensuring the fragile Turian Krogan Alliance can survive. Victory at any cost. <laughs> Number 9 Fist. The owner of Korra's Den and agent of the Shadow Broker is a real scumbag, but he's a well written scumbag. 
For many players, Fist will die in their first conversation with Shepard, either at the hands of Rex or the Commander. But if you spare Fist, he returns on Omega in Mass Effect 2. No longer a criminal, but a lowly dock worker, he spends all his time and money in the Afterlife Club with some hired ladies. Hilariously, he blames his downfall entirely on Commander Shepard, which sounds about right for this guy. No, really, thanks for taking the time to chase a small-time crook off the Citadel so I could squat in this shithole for years. I'm a good boy now, so piss off! Number 10, Admiral Hackett. But we will not fall. We will prevail. Admiral Hackett is the real homie. He puts lots of demands on Shepard throughout the trilogy, but he's always got the commander's back, even when Shepard makes controversial decisions. He's always confident that Shepard can get the job done, and he trusts the commander to carry out the toughest assignments. One of my favorite moments with Hackett happens at the end of the Arrival DLC, after Shepard obliterated the Alpha Relay and vaporized 300,000 Batarians. Shepard hands Hackett a data pad with a report detailing what went down, and like a badass, Hackett just hands it back to the commander without even looking at the details, basically just saying, I trust you, Shepard, and I got your back no matter what comes next. I don't need to see a report to know you did the right thing. Yes, sir. You've done a hell of a thing, Commander. And of course, how could we forget Hackett's epic speech at the end of Mass Effect 3? Stand fast. Stand strong. Stand together. Hack it out. Hackett is the OG, plain and simple. Number 11, Phi Dan. He's the leader of Zoo's Hope that everyone wants us to speak to during the Ferris mission in Mass Effect 1. Phi Dan is a bit of an understated character, but he has a lot of admiral qualities that kind of fly under the radar. For starters, he's the main guy holding things together after the Geth attacked. While some characters have given in to apathy or despair, Phi Dan ensures that his people focused on important tasks, such as fixing water lines and getting power back online. He also organizes the defense to protect the heart of the colony! Protect the heart of the colony! But what I find most admirable about Phi Dan is he's the only colonist who doesn't attack Commander Shepard at the end of the mission. While everyone else has given in to the Thorian's painful mind control, Phi Dan resists, ultimately sacrificing himself to allow Shepard to save the colony. He wants me to stop you, but I won't! I won't! So pour one out for Phi Dan, he was a real homie. Number 12, Udina. The council to save their lives, and for what? Okay, hear me out on this one. I know a lot of y'all hate Udina, and he's definitely not a likable or good guy in most respects. But he's an incredibly compelling character who behaves exactly like you would expect a politician would, always maneuvering and scheming to advance his goals. I think it's hilarious in Mass Effect 1 that he's basically an unhinged lunatic ranting and raving at the council to recognize humanity. He has no right to say that! That's not his decision! I love a lot of the post-mission chats with Udina in Mass Effect 1. Fine. I'll just tell everyone we figured it was a good idea to release a fertile Rachni queen in the wilds of Novaria. I love sad boy Udina. I'm glad to see justice was served. This meeting is adjourned. And I like his character arc in Mass Effect 3. He grows increasingly desperate to gain some kind of support for Earth, and ultimately ends up selling out to Cerberus. It was an incredibly stupid move, but you can kind of see where he was coming from. Shepard hadn't made much progress at that point in terms of building alliances, so perhaps Udina felt like he was running out of time to save Earth. While I find Udina to be disagreeable and ultimately satisfying to take out on the Citadel, I do like how his character was written, which is why I feel he is underrated. So there you have it, the 12 most underrated characters in the Mass Effect trilogy. Who do you think is the most underrated character? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, 
be sure to subscribe to Big Dan Gaming for more Mass Effect and RPG videos. Big shout out to all the channel members for supporting my content. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. I should go.